On today's show, we are taking a break from winter with last summer's visits to gardens in the Oklahoma City area. We begin with three homes from the Oklahoma Horticultural Society's Garden Tour for Connoisseurs, with the Vodder English Garden on the Prairie, the Green Rooms of the Burger Home, and the Tropical Paradise of the Hawks Home. We also visit the Commonwealth Urban Farm CSA and the crime-reducing Central Park Community Gardens. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We're at the home of Linda Vodder, and Linda, you have this beautiful Tudor-style home, and I really see the architecture reflected in your landscape. I assume that's intentional. <laughs> it is very intentional. I'm very design driven. As mm -hmm. I love that tension between things that are tightly clipped mm -hmm. and then things that are kind of billowy, which is also a trademark of English gardens. Mm -hmm. um, I like what I call soft hardscape, the use of gravel and flagstone, natural materials that kind of organically blend in with the different kinds of foliage and textures and shapes and forms. It's all about, to me, shape and form and rhythm and pattern. Mm -hmm. Everything else in terms of what plants you use um, and where you decide to place things are secondary. And that's really the uh, crux of design. Designing for design's sake rather than being a gardener per se, just gardening. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think most of us, when we first start to garden, what are we drawn to? We're drawn to masses of color. Mm -hmm. And it seems counterintuitive that that sometimes should be the last element that you take into account, not the first element. And sometimes I think it's difficult for us to practice the discipline that we need to get the bones in place and reflect the architecture of the home and think about how the space will be used. And then the fun stuff, or what most people think of the fun stuff, the color and the flowers and the vegetables, mm -hmm. that can kind of come later. And here you have a really restricted color scheme which works beautifully, the chartreuse and the purple. Yes, I really love that. You had said earlier, and I completely agree, that plants that are, are variegated or that are light colored can really illuminate a dark space. And I, I love chartreuse, and it's probably my favorite color combination. Lavenders, purples, chartreuses, they just really blend beautifully together. And I, I think, I did a lot of traveling when I first started to garden in Europe and in English gardens and it seemed that this was a very popular color palette and I fell in love with it and haven't gone back. Well let's see how you've used this in the backyard as well. Happy to show you. Mm -hmm. With regards to European design, your not garden in the back is quintessential European. Oh, isn't it? <laughs> I went to Barnsley House, the garden of Rosemary Vary in the Cotswolds, and of course hers is far more elaborate than mine and far larger in scale, but nevertheless I came back with that idea, and I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's two stylized hearts that frame one another with a great focal point in the middle that hosts all different things, scarecrows, alliums, <laughs> right now I've just got a simple urn, mm -hmm. but it's nice, it gives a nice framework 
it always looks good. Mm -hmm. In the winter, the framework of box always looks good. And then you can play around with vegetables and flowers and ornamentals um, inside each quadrant. It also keeps you honest. It's very easy to maintain because you can do it a section at a time. Oh, that's a nice approach to gardening. Yeah, it really little is. Bit, little easy uh -huh. to manipulate break, spaces. Break it up. <laughs> Save your back and your sanity. And you have just wonderful transitions throughout from one space to oh, the thank next. You. Here we have a really nice uh, example of that tension you talked about with the the clipped um, box. Yeah, it's and kind the of wild. a reflection of English gardening, where things that are closer to the house tend to be more manicured and clipped, and the farther away you get from the house, they become a little more wild. And I just love that tension. I love the strong structure and the architecture of a really strong clipped form against things that are blousy and billowy and more romantic. And in seasons when our gardens look less than their best, and in mm -hmm. Oklahoma that can be pretty frequently, <laughs> it really helps to have that structure because it always looks good even if the surrounding flowers aren't quite so presentable. Well, Linda, your, your backyard, uh, you know, we're in a small urban lot, but you've done such a beautiful job of creating usable spaces and with their own sort of identity, uh, own little room. Yes, and I mean, people ask me, well, do you ever sit? And no, I don't <laughs> sit, but I have to say that this is an extension of our home. It is a very usable space for a variety of different reasons. We entertain a lot, and it has to be very functional and very practical. So consequently, you can kind of get a twofer by blending that practicality of, for example, the flagstone in the turf with that kind of English aesthetic of the beautiful organic natural quality of the stepping stones and the flagstones against the vibrant green of the grass. Every detail here is done just beautifully. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Well, thank you us. for coming. Joining us is Martha Berger, and Martha, you have just an adorable house. I absolutely love it, and the unique character of the chimney with its curves, and I can see that character reflected here in your landscape as well. Well, thank you very much. I love the word adorable because, <laughs> um, you know, I, when I think about this, I think of grandma's garden, and I think grandma would appreciate that word as well, but cozy with um, just a really warm and inviting place is sort of the spirit of what um, really drew me to this garden. Mm -hmm. And the entryway, um, a lot of bright colors from the flowers, mm -hmm. uh, that interesting grass up against the red brick, the mm -hmm. blue line Boo, just uh -huh. stands out completely. So it certainly is inviting. And you were talking to me earlier, you have another very inviting element, which is your outdoor dining room. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Well, my outdoor dining room is right off the kitchen, so that makes it convenient. Um, but it also is very close to the street, where, and I'm on a corner, and so there's a lot of people that are out walking, kids and dogs, all the time. And I can hear them talking when I'm out there, and I love that. And, and sometimes I'll hear, gosh, look at that arbor, or oh, I can smell them grilling. And before you know it, I'm having a conversation and they want to come in and see the sculpture that's there. I have a big chicken sculpture. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of love that. I feel private, but I also feel like I'm really part of the neighborhood. And, and that's, that's really good for me. Well, that connection to our neighbors is so important. Absolutely. So here we're walking through your out, outside uh, living area. Yes. And again, we see that brickwork echoed 
um, in the patio area. Yes. Uh, you have a wonderful fountain. I imagine that this is just a, a wonderful place to relax and entertain. In the you know, it is. I feel like uh, many people do with their outdoor spaces. They want to be able to just flow from the outside and inside and back and forth. And um, mine is, is really good space for that. It's right off the living room. Uh, the brickwork is um, really interesting. I have a round chimney and it has circular brick around it. There's circular brick here and then in the dining area as well. So it's pretty cool that it's been replicated and is sort of part of the house. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice uh, connection there. Mm -hmm. And even some of the plant material as I look around, I feel connection. We have these two beautiful lace bark elms with the orange bark. Uh, kind of reflecting mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. the brick. Mm -hmm. So I look at your landscape, a lot of small rooms, and the last one on the side of the house, I'd like to go take a look at that. Sure, that's one of my favorite spots as well. I imagine this is your quiet place, somewhere you come for reflection. It is. Um, first thing in the morning, after I make my obligatory cup of coffee, I head out here. This is right off my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is where I sit, look at the calendar for the day, catch up on what's happening, read the texts from family, mm -hmm. uh, family members, and uh, really just kind of get my act together mm -hmm. for the day. Mm -hmm. um, I also uh, practice guided meditation oh. occasionally and so I'll put my headphones on and come out here and listen to um, you know a tape or something like that but I love this space out here. It's small but uh, powerful. Very powerful. You're completely involved in nature. What a perfect yep. place for mm -hmm. meditation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful landscape with us. Oh it's my pleasure. I love it. paradise here in Oklahoma with Bill Hawks. Bill, I just uh, really appreciate your passion for plants and what you've done here in your landscape. Thank Tell you. me a bit about uh, what you're doing, what's your goal back here? <laughs> well, I, you know, over the years I've just collected plants that I like and uh, the, the topography allows for different elevations mm -hmm. and I find that interesting so I've put plants that are winter hardy, um, the, the yuccas and the, uh, the uh, agaves I take in, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know, if I like it, I plant it and find <laughs> a spot for it. That's pretty much it. One of the biggest collections as we move through your landscape are the elephant ears and um, your entryway is just a stunning display, uh, display of, there's about three uh, varieties there. Tell me about those. Well, there's um, uh, black coral, mm -hmm. there's Mickey Mouse, there is, uh, and I'm not certain of the name of a, the large leaf alocasia. Right. Um, and lime zingers. Mm -hmm. Lime zinger gives that chartreuse that just plays so nicely with the blacks. Right. The Mickey Mouse, that's one that I've not seen before, and it has some really interesting textures on I the I love, foliage. and every leaf is unique. Mm -hmm. So another uh, unique plant you have in the landscape that I see repeated throughout are these globe catulpas. Yes. And uh, let's go take a look. You have a bigger planting around the side. Okay. So Bill, these are globe catulpas, and I know you can buy these this way. Yes. Um, it's a grafted tree, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is the graft mm -hmm. right here. And we can buy them grafted, but you know that's no fun, right? <laughs> Well, they're pretty easy to graft, mm -hmm. and so I learned how to graft them a few years ago, and I love the plant, and uh, thought that a lower graft uh, would allow me to see more of the canopy, mm -hmm. and so I just started playing with different heights of these 
uh, umbrella catapas, globe catapas. Right, yeah, they go by a few names. And so each, uh, do you do much pruning on them to keep them compact? You know, this is the way they grow, mm -hmm. but I do trim them back a little bit every year. Uh, it's a brittle wood, and so if they get too long, they'll break, and then they, they don't have a good shape. Yeah. So I just lightly give them a haircut. Okay. I think the large leaves and their kind of golden green color really plays nicely with the tropical look of the surrounding landscape. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, they mirror the leaf of the potato vine too, mm -hmm. so. Yes. Now, throughout the landscape you have some beautiful sculptures as well and kind of carry you around uh, some of the open spaces. We're in the cross timbers, so there's a lot of you know, open areas, but you've really just balanced that nicely with transitions of sculptural work, um, the rocks. Uh, I, I called it your Zen garden. <laughs> <laughs> and it lead us to uh, the most magnificent view in the garden, which is overlooking your water garden. Bill, you have a very dramatic uh, pathway down to the pond, um, some beautiful tropicals. Um, at work, we call this the pudding plant. <laughs> uh-huh, tapioca. <laughs> yes, this is gorgeous. And uh, of course, the feature here, your lily pond. Tell me a bit about this. Well, it's been a work in progress. I built it uh, 20 years ago and um, have, uh, you know, uh, I have tropicals in here and winter hardies and, um, take the tropicals into the greenhouse and bring them back out and so these are plants that have done well for me and I just keep repropagating them. And looking around there's got to be at least a dozen different varieties in here Yes. and from all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. There's some Amazon lilies mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most all of these are, are um, hybrids that have been uh, recently Produced. New introductions yeah. to the market. A lot of times, you know, the lilies are adored for their just the, the beautiful flowers, but in here, I'm just really struck by the foliage on some of these varieties. Yes. I'm, I'm as fascinated by the foliage as I am the blossoms. Mm -hmm. And I see some of them shifting to red. Is that when they're that the says individual leaves dying out? That's starting to die, yes. What a beautiful way to go. Isn't it pretty? Yeah. <laughs> So you've been inspired by these plants after you've worked with them for a number of a years. A long time. I never, I never get tired of them. And you've actually, uh, one of your other hobbies aside from managing an amazing water garden is in the arts and working with glass. Casting glass, yes. Mm -hmm. And so when did you first start to use uh, your lilies in your artwork? I've been doing that about two years. Yeah. They are just simply magnificent. Thank you. Uh, amazing very much. work. So it's certainly a treat for our visitors to come see not only this beautiful landscape, but, but a get a glimpse of uh, how that's inspired your work as Thank well. You. Thank you. I'm having fun with it. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. You're welcome. Commonwealth Urban Farms in Oklahoma City. Joining me is Leah Woods. And Leah, uh, Commonwealth Urban Farms is a CSA uh, and a very urban one at that. Tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about the history. Sure, well, um, a group of us got together in the fall of 2010 and began talking about we wanted to have um, more green space in our neighborhoods and we wanted to see how we could grow food together. And um, so out of a year-long conversation, Commonwealth Urban Farms um, emerged. And um, we are um, both a CSA and a, um, an 
an advocate for urban farming and urban gardening in Oklahoma City. So we have, um, currently we have this lot and we have a 25 member CSA. Um, it starts in, going from April through uh, November and members come once a week and pick up their vegetables. Yeah, well let's go up into the gardens and sure. take a look. And just as a reminder for our viewers, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And I find the beauty of that system is that the, the customers really get to know where their food's coming mm -hmm. from and obviously who's growing it and how, how it's produced. And your customers are also pretty involved out here. They are, right. We, we believe in the know your, farmer, know, know your food. Mm -hmm. um, so when members come and pick up their vegetables, they can come and see what's happening in the garden every week, you know, mm -hmm. see what's changed each week and see where their vegetables are actually being grown. Um, and a lot of members will come um, and volunteer either on Saturday mornings or on Fridays and you know, come help out with one aspect of it or another. So um, they get to really be part of how their food is grown. And you had mentioned to me earlier that that's an important part of your farm is education. Mm -hmm. And so here they get kind of a hands-on learning while they're working in the gardens with yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. And what other types of educational opportunities do they have? Well. Um, Hands-on is the best, yeah, <laughs> so we absolutely. always encourage that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I do an um, uh, e-newsletter once a week mm -hmm. and um, try to fill people in a little bit on what they might not just see in the garden, like you know what it takes to, um, like what we do when we have um, broccoli cabbage worms and mm -hmm. um, what we do for soil fertility and um, how we try to encourage um, beneficial insects. Well, Leah, we visited a more uh, suburban type CSA. What do you think the advantage of being very urban is? Um, I think it's fabulous to be right in the middle of the city. We're so close to so many different people. So um, some of our members walk our bike to get here, and um, we are encouraging more and more members from our neighborhood to, to join. Um, and even people who drive, you know, are still pretty close by. So that's great, and people can come and be involved. People who aren't even in the CSA can just come, and um, you know, some of our neighbors just come over and visit from time to time just to see what's happening and to learn about it. So it's great to be just really involved, really connected mm -hmm. to the garden. Now the challenge of being in an urban setting is this once had a house, and that house had been treated for termites, which means there's chloridane in the soil, mm -hmm. possibly lead. Uh, but you've been working hard to overcome that. Tell us just brief, how do you, how do you yeah. deal with chloridane? So we've done a lot of research on this, and um, fortunately there are um, biological solutions mm -hmm. to um, chloridane and, and other toxins in the soil. Um, so the first step, of course, is just to do a soil test and find out what you have. Absolutely. Um, for um, us in the south, it's likely that there'll be chloridane contamination. Um, chloridane is a termiticide that was banned in 1988, but it stays in the soil. So um, what we try to do is reintroduce microbial life into the soil mm -hmm. by adding compost and growing cover crops. Mm -hmm. And then the microbes, the microbes will break down the chloridane over time, uh -huh. given the right conditions. And so I um, would encourage all of our viewers, if they're thinking about an urban garden, to do the soil tests right, and absolutely. take a season or two to treat that soil. Mm -hmm. Right, and if you're adding compost to the soil, I mean, compost is the answer to almost every problem. <laughs> so just continue to add compost to the soil will help with anything really. Excellent. Well, as part of your educational component, you're going to be uh, hosting Ag Week, Urban Ag mm -hmm. Week this mm -hmm. September. Um, so we want our viewers to be aware of, uh, you're going to have urban farm tour. We are. We'll have a speaker, an out-of-town speaker, and some workshops. Mm -hmm. um, it will be the culmination of a film series that we're doing this summer, and um, then we'll do an urban farm tour. Uh, the first Saturday in September. Excellent. Well, we'll make sure to post that information as it gets closer and encourage people to come out and see what you're doing. Thank you, Kim. Thanks so much. We're at the Central Park Community Gardens in Oklahoma City. Joining me is Alan Parlier. Alan, you started this with uh, some colleagues a few years ago as a way to address crime in the neighborhood. Tell me a bit about that. Well, it was in the middle 90s. Our neighborhood was struggling. There was a lot of boarded up houses and um, a lot of gang activity and graffiti and crime. And we had noticed on our block that front yard gardening helped bring people, diverse people together of different cultures and economic situations and different languages. And so we thought perhaps on a neighborhood wide level, it would work. And 
we went to the county because these lots had been repossessed for non-payment of back taxes and we thought let's start here and the county said we can't give it to you but we can give it to the city and the city can give it to you and so we got that arranged and these lots were given to our neighborhood association for use as a community garden and um, we thought possibly growing food would be a, a way to bring the neighborhood together and reduce crime and involve more youth and help create more pride in the neighborhood. And you told me earlier that within six months you saw a turnaround in your neighborhood. Absolutely. We started on this block here because on this six block area it was the highest crime statistics in our neighborhood and literally within six months it became the lowest crime statistics in our neighborhood because people came out, got to know each other, got to work together and, and the criminals didn't want to see their customers seen or, mm -hmm. or whatever and or their youth got, their children got involved working with us in the gardens and there's a little grade school three blocks that way and a high school two blocks that way and we got those kids involved and their classes involved and it really helped bring the neighborhood together building community not just growing food but growing a community and what great lessons for the youth you work with and that organization is closer to earth closer to earth is the mm -hmm. youth group that our neighborhood association started in 2007 uh, to involve kids that are doing school required community service from charter schools as well as court required community service uh, working together to do the maintenance and do the planting and planning uh, for for our gardens and once they finish their hours they can apply to be a paid garden trainee garden intern to work with other kids coming in well, what a beautiful impact you're having and um, a great model for other communities thank you so much absolutely join us next week as we focus on herbs kim and herb expert jackie savage collect herbs for tea show how to properly dry herbs and how to brew tea using fresh herbs. To get you ready for spring, Kim shows how to cut back overwintered herbs and transplant others that have been started indoors from seed. Join us then for more of the best TV you'll grow to love. For additional information, show notes, plant lists, recipes, and fact sheets, visit our website or contact your local Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service office. Segments from this episode, along with hundreds more from previous episodes, are available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Oklahoma Gardening. Be sure to join our Facebook group for information on upcoming episodes and gardening events, photos, and discussions of gardening topics. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens. This outdoor television studio is made possible with the help of our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery, and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.